Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Stacy Converse, and I am here with my colleague who can introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Pelletier. I'm from Speaking Up For Us. Speaking Up For Us is a nonprofit organization run with people with disability for people with disabilities, and we help them to support their way of getting supports and choosing how they want to run their lives on their own way. And I am from Disability Rights Maine, which is Maine's protection and advocacy organization. We provide legally based advocacy services and we represent people whose rights have been violated or who have been discriminated against based on their disability. Um, our mission is to ensure autonomy, inclusion, equality, and access for people with disabilities. As um, Abby mentioned, everyone is muted. We have um, specific um, spots in this presentation left open for questions where Abby will do what she was talking about, unmuting, or we'll pull up the questions from the question box during that time period. Um, and this, this training is for educational purposes only. I'm not giving you legal advice. Um, all the information you're getting today is timely as of today, but the law changes rapidly. So um, before relying on any of the information contained in this training, you should consult with an attorney. Our overview, overview of the training is guardianship basic Supported Decision Making, SDM Overview, Changes to Main Guardianship Law, and SDM in Action. So this is Stacy, and just briefly, what is guardianship? It's the legal process by which the ability to take, to make some or all decisions are taken away from one person and given to another. Full guardianship removes all decision-making authority, including the right to decide about healthcare, money, education, work, where to live, and the ability to enter into contracts. And I'm just pausing to give the interpreter a minute to catch up. And historically, guardianship in Maine has been granted on the basis of diagnosis, the perceived best interest of the individual in question, and the alleged inability to make responsible decisions. It's important to note that only a court can award guardianship. Guardianship is overused nationally and even more so here in Maine. In Maine, approximately 70% of people receiving developmental services have guardians. The vast majority of those guardians are full guardians. And this compares to a national average of people receiving similar services that are under guardianship. Only 35% of those individuals are under guardianship. Stacey, can you repeat that last part again for the interpreter? Yeah, um, so, so um, in Maine, about 70% 70 per, 70 of people um, who receive developmental services are under guardianship. That compares to a national average of individuals receiving similar services, which is at about 35%. Okay, this is Kyle Pelletier. What is supported decision making plan for people to make their own decisions with help based on the bill flip that decision making is a skill to get better with practice. And this is Stacy again. Um, um, and I'm waiting for the interpreter catch up. 
And as we'll talk about going, going forward, um, SDM must be considered as part of the guardianship process um, if anyone's considering guardianship. Okay, this is Kyle again. Your decision making, what big decisions have you made recently? Did anything help you? If so, who? What kind of help did they give you? And we are hoping that people will sort of think about this and maybe jot down your answers to, to have going forward, but just think about, you know, a decision you've made recently. Did you get any help? And um, what kind of help did you get? And we'll give people a few minutes or a, a, a minute or so to think about that. been close to a minute and I think I've reached my capacity of, of sitting here in silence. So um, we'll move to the next slide, Kyle. Okay, this is Kyle again. That is supportive decision making. The three important questions people who want to use supportive decision making should ask. Okay, one, which discussion, two, who do I want help from, and three, what kind of help? And just to go back to what you thought about, right? So you were answering these same questions for yourself. Um, so, um, that is supported decision making. That is exactly, you know, getting help to make a decision from someone else. Exactly, because I always, I always think of what I want to talk about on a certain time of, dis, of, of a decision that I'm trying to make. Then I ask opinions from my family, friends, and everyone else. So. Right. Yeah. Have you used supported decision making for any big decisions lately, Kyle? Yeah. I like I had help I had help with my wife's family to make decisions on how we are going to do our wedding and we came up with a decision and we we stick through it and we got married and we and every decision that we made we we discussed. Yeah, and I, I have support in decisions I make too. So um, I use supported decision making when I make any sort of big purchase. So it um, when I bought a house, I had to talk to a lot of people. So I you know I guess a supporter was probably the 
the inspector who came out to the house and really looked things over for me. My realtor was a supporter. And then certainly I leaned a lot on family and friends about advice about buying a house and which house I was going to buy. And now we have a poll. just launched it so you guys should be able to um, participate. Okay. Um, so we're just asking whether or not Kyle and I shared about us both using supported decision making and just asking the audience if, if they use supported decision making as well. You just take a minute to answer. Okay, um, well, it looks like we have a bunch of sort of experts in that have used this before. So we will we will continue on about um, how supported, where supported decision-making came from and a little bit more about the law and some tips on using it, so. This is Kyle again. Where does SDM come from? how we make decisions and self-advocacy. Um, you know, and in some ways, as, as we've kind of talked about, like uh, supported decision-making is really just decision-making. It's how we all make decisions through research, advice, gathering information needed. Um, and self-advocates for a long time have identified um, problems with guardianship and the use of guardianship and really looked for and promoted alternatives. Um, in the last time um, this was when the guardianship law was before the Judiciary Committee, a bunch of self-advocates um, testified in favor of including supported decision making. And I just wanted to share an excerpt um, from one of the testimonies that were presented at the hearing. And this is from Joshua Wiedemann. Um, and he said, I feel free and excited about my life. I feel like I'm an adult. I have more control over my own life and the freedom to make the choices that are my choices. I choose activities that I like to do. If I wasn't able to have input in my life, I would feel like I was in prison. It empowers me. Supported decision-making allows people to choose the people who will help them. And there's a lot of support both internationally and um, across the country um, for supported decision making. This is not something that's unique um, to Maine alone, although Maine was one of the first states in the country really to add legislation. So supported decision making in part also comes from the international human rights, um, the right of everyone to make decisions on their own, which is put into um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It specifically says persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. Um, and this, so countries signing this treaty um, must provide support to people with, dis with disabilities in exercising their legal capacity. Um, there's also supported decision making has been enacted in 15 states around the country in one way or another. It looks a little bit different in every state. Um, the first state to do it was Texas in 2015. As you can see, Maine, we did it in 2018. Um, and in the last session, when I was doing some research on, on where um, there were supported decision making laws, there was a lot of activity um, in the 2020 legislatures around the country. So. I would expect to see more um, next year. Just wanted to highlight some key differences between 
supported decision making and guardianship. So supported decision making presumes capacity and maintains autonomy. Um, and autonomy really is just about a person's ability to act on his or her own values and interests. Um, supported decision making is a least, the least restrictive alternative. It allows for individualized supports and accommodations to aid in decision making. And it acknowledges other practical and legal options that can address challenges and needs. In contrast, Guardianship is restrictive by design and individuals <clears throat> powers and rights and authority are transferred to another person. Uh, and guardianship should only be considered after all less restrictive alternatives have been explored. Okay, this is Kyle again. Uh, policy and support decision making. Guardians is not a guarantee that abuse, neglect, and exploitation would happen. Supporting decision making has protection against abuse and exploitation built into it. So pe people often um, request guardianship as a way to protect their loved ones that they think are at risk. Um, it's important to understand that guardianship is limited to decision making and it's not a guarantee against abuse, neglect, exploitation. Um, in many ways, um, depriving a person of independence and encouraging dependence on a guardian may in some ways put people more at risk. For example, a high percentage of people receiving developmental service in, in Maine have guardians, like we talked about before, that, that number is about 75, 70%. Um, and these individuals still have adult protective services involved in their lives. Um, in contrast, supported decision making has some checks um, built into it. So it's often a team of supporters who serve as checks on one another. And it really empowers the person to to find their voice and to identify problems and um, ways to share their concerns with others. Um, this is Abby. So there was one question that already came up um, and that was who originally came up with the idea um, for supported decision making? I don't know that we exactly know that. Isn't that horrible? That's a great question um, because it's been used all around the world. So can Canadians use it a lot? It's used a lot in Bulgaria. It's used in Australia. So I'm not sure. Um, but if if that person maybe wants to send their name on to you, Abby, we could check into it and get back to them. Sounds good. Um, and someone else asked, how do you start the process for supported decision making? Okay, um, so so you can, it depends who you are, right? So if you, I think one good way to look at it is we've provided a guide as part of this. I think really looking through that, if you're interested in supported decision-making, looking at the options, there's some worksheets that we're gonna talk about that really can help identify answers to those questions, those three big questions, which is who do you get support from? What kind of support do you want? And what kind of decisions do you want support on? And it can really walk you through it. So I think that's really the, the first step to, to start talking and thinking about it. I don't know if you have anything to add, Kyle. No. Okay. Uh, and the next question was, is there a plan outline for um, a team to put this in place, which I think we've answered. Um, so I don't know, Stacey, if you have anything else you wanna to add to that. No, and if we haven't answered, um, hopefully we can move through the rest of our presentation a little more quickly. And, and that's what the end of our presentation really is about. So if, if we don't answer it by then, we can, um, we can answer questions at the end. Sure. And one more question popped up um, 
on if an individual already has guardianship in place in another state and then moves to Maine, does that guardianship automatically get transferred or can that individual then apply or qualify for supported living in Maine? That is a very complicated question. It's really an individualized question that's, um, I would suggest that they, you know, maybe contact us offline about, um, I think it gets really complicated with the, the transfer of guardianship, but I will say that anyone can use supported decision making. People who have guardians should be using supported decision making. The, so I'll get into the law in just a second, really requires guardians really to promote decision making of individuals. And so building that ability to make decisions should be part of any guardianship. Great. And I didn't and, see anybody raise their hand to um, ask any questions. So if, but if someone does, um, I will try to answer that. So I think we're probably okay to move on. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Oops. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about supported decision making in, in Maine's new guardianship law. Um, so Maine's new guardianship law, um, a court can only appoint a guardian if supported decision making or other less restrictive alternatives are not enough to help a person make decisions. Through, as we just talked about, guardians must encourage individuals to participate in decisions and promote self-determination. And it also includes a, guard, a, a grievance process. So if your guardian isn't helping you or including you, um, you can file a grievance against your guardian with the probate court. And this, this law was a huge change in Maine's guardianship law, which hasn't really changed since the 1970s. Um, it went into effect in September of 2019. These are just the major changes. There were a lot more changes, but these are just the ones I'm highlighting. Um, another one I'd like to highlight is that the new guardianship law removes a lot of the offensive language that was in the previous version. One example of that is it's um, a person who has a guardian is, is referred to throughout as an individual subject to guardianship. Can you repeat that last part again, Stacy, for the interpreter? Yeah. The person. Um, yeah. So uh, another really good change, I think, in this new guardianship law is that it removed a lot of offensive language that was contained in there. For example, um, a person who has a guardian is now referred to as an individual subject to guardianship. And, guard, and the, the probate code really looks at um, less restrictive alternatives to guardianship. Um, it just means, it's a, it means exactly what you probably think it means, which is uh, an approach to meeting an individual needs that restricts fewer rights than would the appointment of a guardian or conservator. Um, and it specifically lists um, what less restrictive alternatives are which includes supported decision-making, appropriate technological assistance, appointment of an agent, including an power of attorney for health or finances, or appointment of a representative payee. And, and a less, the less restrictive alternative in that concept was also included in the previous version, um, but it, it was implicit in that version. And this just makes it far more explicit and really emphasizes it throughout. Um, and so I'm gonna next show you the definition of supported decision-making specifically um, in guardianship law, which is very consistent with what we've talked about earlier. So, Supported decision making means assistance from one or more persons of an individual's choosing in understanding the nature and consequences 
a person a potential personal and financial decisions that enables the individual to make decisions and when consistent with the individual's wishes and communicating a decision once it's made. Um, again, the key focus on this is really it's done at the direction of the person making the decisions um, and it's their decisions that are made. And the, the, this um, analysis around whether less restrictive alternatives, including supported decision-making could be used instead of guardianship, it's throughout the core process. So here are some key places where it's considered. So it's considered when an individual petitions for a guardianship. So this is what gets the whole process started. It's all that paperwork you fill out with the court. It must state in there, what alternatives to guardianship have tried, why they didn't work, how long were they explored. Oops, sorry. Um, it's also included um, in the visitor's report. So a visitor will be appointed um, by the court to go out and meet the individual. Um, and they have to report back whether or not supported decision making and other less restrictive alternatives would meet the person's needs. And I'm just giving the interpreter a minute. It must also be considered as part of the judge's orders. Um, they must find by clear and convincing evidence that the individual's needs cannot be met through less restrictive alternatives. And it must also be considered as part of the annual report that guardians um, file with the court, which um, talks about whether guardianship continues to be necessary and what alternatives have been tried for the individual. I'll launch the poll right now real quick. <laughs> Um, so just asking which of the following are true. Um, guardianship can only be created by a court order. Supported decision-making can only be created by a court order or all of the above. If you just take a minute to answer that poll. All right, I will end it now and share the results. Okay, so we have a really super smart audience here because they got it right. So guardianship can only be created by a court order. I threw in a trick question with supported decision making. So that's a common held belief sometimes that we hear um, that supported decision making can be created by a court order. Um, it isn't created by a court order. It's considered like we just talked about when someone's going through the guardianship process, but the creation of supported decision-making, development of a team, everything like that is created outside of the court. Awesome, so I'll stop sharing this now. Okay. And then um, we were just gonna break for a couple minutes for questions. We have um, a bunch more to cover and may hold off to answer most questions at the end if there's a lot. Awesome. Yeah. So one question came in and it's a little bit complicated, but um, it was asking whether when services are asking for a signature, would if someone was using supported decision making, would the person that's using supported decision making sign or would other people like on the person's team sign for them? 
And that's gonna, I, generally it would be the person that would, would sign. I'll say that as my general sort of statement on that one. I, I suppose it could look different, but, but generally it would be the person that would be signing. Awesome, okay. I think that's the only question I see right now. Um, so maybe we can move on. If anybody wants to raise their hand, as always, you can do that. Um, but I think that's all I see for now. Okay. This is Kyle again. Supported decision making in action. So just a reminder, I think when you signed up, there was information about that you can get the handbook. Here's also where you can find it if you want to, you know, download it and flip through it now or, or just have it in the future. Oh, this is Kyle again. We have a pop quiz. So I hope this fantastic audience knows the answer for this pop quiz. And so what are the three questions someone who wants to use supported decision-making should ask themselves? If you just take a minute to think about those three questions, maybe jot them down before we move on. Okay, um, Kyle, I'm wondering if maybe you can share with folks what the answers to the three questions are. Sure. So if they got these three questions right, I'm sorry, we have no stickers, but <laughs> congratulations. One, which, which discussion? Two, who do I want help from and three what kind of help and then we have a quick poll just to see what how um where people were at with this so i will launch that right now and so the poll just says which of the following questions do you remember i got one of the questions i got two of the questions I got all three of the questions, or I didn't get any of the questions. So you just take a quick moment to answer that. And I will end it here so and share the results with all of you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for doing that. And it looks like is, we do have a smart audience. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say, it's pretty consistent with what we've seen before. So thank you. And so breaking down those questions a little bit, Kyle, um, can, you, can you talk about this? Um, what kind of decisions may need support? Yeah. So this is Kyle again, discussing about money, discussing about where to live, discussing about school, discussing about legal issues, discussing about safety, discussing about voting, and discussing about medical treatment. Right, so uh, there's a ton of different decisions. So these are just some may apply to some people, some may not apply. Um, some people may not be in school anymore, but may have other areas of life that they need help in, like buying a car like me or getting married like Kyle. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of decisions and it's gonna change over time. 
So that's the first question. So really looking at it, and a lot of this is broken down more in the supported decision making handbook that you all should have access to. So now moving on to the second question. Okay, this is Kyle again. Choosing supports. The decision maker chooses who supports them. Can be a family member, friends, neighbor, case manager, religion, leader, and professionals. The decision maker can assign Care, Carolyn supports and Carolyn type of discussions and not others. Right. So that, that last, last point, we see that a lot. So um, individuals may have um, frequently, the most frequent sort of supports we see in for supported decision making are usually parents. So um, parents are usually part of decisions. Sometimes we see that um, individuals would rather have other people in their lives like a sister or brother or a friend help them with um, relationship decisions. So some of that, um, it, that's a real sort of common one we sometimes see. Oops, I'm going backwards now. Um, I wanted just to share a, a little bit of testimony again from a self-advocate who testified in front of the legislature. This is from Stephanie Pelletier um, and her, her last name is not a coincidence. Um, she said when she testified back um, a couple years ago, when I need to make a decision, I get opinions from my mom, dad, and sister. They give me, they help me figure stuff out. I'm getting married and they plan to help, they help me plan for how much it is going to cost. I am the one that makes the final choice. I like having the final choice because it makes me more independent. And so this was Steph Stephanie's testimony. Um, in support of adding supported decision making to Maine's guardianship yeah. law. And this is Kyle Pelletier again. Yes, Stephanie Pelletier is my wife. So, <laughs> all right, and I will launch our poll. So, what kind of qualities would you look for when choosing a supporter? Honest, bossy kind, controlling, respectful, or other. You would just take a couple minutes to do that. All right, and I will stop it here and share the results with you all. Yeah. Not surprisingly, no one chose bossy or controlling. So I think, you know, when we're asked to be supporters or we're supporters for other people, we should probably remember those. Um, exactly. And then. This is Kyle again. Second opinions. It's always a good to have a second opinion or a third opinion or a fourth exactly on the discussion. Expectly the big decision. Because if you just have one discussion you could not like that decision at the end of it and you could have to face the consequences at the end of it. Right. 
And so we've gone through already the first two questions. So we went through number one, um, what kind of decisions? I think we talked a little bit about who we wanted to help us. And now um, we're gonna move on to this. And I'll turn it back over to Kyle. Okay, this is Kyle again. What kind of support? Gathering information, technical link, tech, teaching, teaching the decision maker, weighing the pros and cons, understand the consequences, and communicating the discussion. And oh, again, decision. you know. So, yeah, yeah, there's there's a ton of different types of support a per person can be provided. And so these are just some ideas and every person I think is going to get have different things and a different combination of, of many things. And then really wanted to highlight um, this chart that's in the um, supported decision making guide that you all have access to it's this starts on page 19 and you'll see um, money management is a common thing that people identify needing support with, and it really breaks it down into very um, specific areas um, that a person might need support with, um, including, um, you know, paying rent, keeping a budget, um, making decisions about money, um, and making sure that no one um, is taking the person's money. And so it really goes through and identifies um, whether the person can do it alone, whether the person needs some kind of support and identifies the support the person needs. And if you flip through, there's many other areas um, so there, this one's money management, but it includes healthcare, education, employment, relationships, community living, legal matters, personal safety. And again, this is gonna look a little different for everybody. So, um, and can be modified to use um, for each individual and is really just intended to be a tool to help someone identify what kind of supports they need. Okay, this is Kyle Pelletier again. Supported decision-making agreement. You do not have to use one at all. Put everything in writing. Writing. You can use the one in the handbook or you can write something else that works for you. And not everyone, as Kyle mentioned, uses a written agreement. It can be, and often is, um, far more informal. I use informal supported decision making. Um, but many people find it helpful to have the plan written out so people are really clear about what their roles are and also to share it with people who are accepting those decisions to really explain how um, an individual is making decisions. So I'm making decisions and I'm bringing um, someone into my doctor's appointment and they, they help me make the decision about medical decisions. And here is my agreement that explains how that's going to work. Um, Kyle mentioned there's a sample in the, in the guide. Um, it's just a sample. We think it's a pretty good one, but there's lots of different ones. You can Google supported decision making. Um, agreement and there's lots of different ones and it again should be really um, tailored to the individual's needs. Um, and then um, some other support tools. So these are pretty identical to less restrictive alternatives that are considered um, in the probate code, but they can be used in combination with supported decision making. So supported decision making isn't an all or nothing sort of thing. So 
You can have supported decision making and also use advanced healthcare directives, powers of attorney, trust, representative payees, and short term orders. And sorry, um, and a short term order is a, a protective arrangement um, that can be used instead of guardianship, um, but it is something um, that the court appoints someone and it's for a single transaction or a series of transactions. Um, so while it would be wholly inappropriate to appoint a guardian for everything, um, you know, they may find that that it's appropriate for just a limited set of um, transactions. And just as a really brief recap on everything I think we've gone over today, um, the decision maker is the one in charge. Um, a supporter should never substitute their decision for the decision makers. So none of us want that bossy supporter. Um, And it's important to remember that the decision maker decides for which decisions they want support, who they want to support them, and what kind of support they want to receive. The decision maker may make a different decision than a supporter thinks is best. And the decision maker can decide to change their supported decision making plan or end it entirely. And that is the end of our formal presentation. And we'd be happy to answer any questions people may have. Awesome. So yeah, as I said, you guys can raise your hand if, um, if you choose to um, and or post in the Q&A. Um, someone had written um, to follow up on the question about signing documents for um, treatment asked earlier. If an individual requests for an appointed uh, person to be responsible for signing consents and making decisions about mental health care, would SDM cover this? Or would a formal document be um, needed to be in place to allow the appointed person to sign um, for treatment? I think what they're really talking about there is a power of attorney for health care decisions. Sounds good. Um, and I am not seeing any other questions right now. I don't know if people, we can give it a minute and if people can think of anything. Oh, someone asked, um, can you have a, a power of attorney for someone that's 18 or older? Yes. Yes. The person decides that they're going to um, enter into a power of attorney um, and identifies who that person would be and, and what kind of decisions they're looking for help with. Um, and I, again, I'm not seeing any other questions of people, anybody who um, wants to write one in, certainly you can. Um, but yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. And, um, and I, I really appreciate everyone coming today. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day. And I'll just give you support the the website one more time. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Kyle. Awesome. All right. Bye, everyone.